Amen, amen. It is so good to be a child of God, isn't it? What a great, great promise that we have. You know one of the great things about being a child? You get to go on spring break. <laughs> oh, anybody here get a chance to, to go on vacation, trip or anything? Awesome, awesome. Very, very cool. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and take a seat. Um, and, and, and maybe, maybe a few of us got to go on vacation, got to have a little bit of a, a relaxed time. Maybe just a, a minute, maybe just turn to the person next to you, maybe it's somebody that you, know, you already know what they did this week, but maybe just share, hey, this is what I did. Um, some of you might have just, I just worked. Um, we'll pray for you. Um, but others of you might have had vacation, might have gone somewhere, you had kids, you, you went on a trip, maybe just share that with the person uh, next to you. Maybe share your name if you don't know them, all right? I invite you to do that. Just take a minute. Go ahead and wrap it up. Wrap it up. I love hearing the sound in the room. Oh, this is, oh, it fills me with joy to hear the sound in the room. It's one of the things I love about student ministry is is having conversation, hearing dialogue, getting people uh, talking with each other. Uh, If you're new, uh, maybe first, second time, or maybe you just um, don't get to see me very much, uh, it's because I'm downstairs with students usually. My name's Ben. I direct the student ministry here at uh, Westside, Uh, and it's uh, an honor to to be up uh, here with you today. So uh, being an adult now, it's weird. It's weird. Um, I, I miss spring break. Uh, wouldn't it be great if spring break was just across the board, like it, it applied to work as well, and you could just have that vacation, and it didn't count as your vacation days? That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, because uh, I'm in student ministry, uh, one of the, th- the things that I actually do like, though, is that uh, because students go on spring break, and, and, and they're gone, and sometimes families go on vacations and whatnot, I usually don't program a whole lot to happen during that week, because it's, it's hit and miss on whether or not kids will, will be in town. And so, usually, it's, it's a little bit of a slow week for me, um, which I really, really do enjoy. So, a couple of weeks ago, actually, though, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, his name is Bob, uh, he texted me, and he said, hey, you know... He's a paraeducator, so I'm on vacation, I have spring break. Uh, Do you think I can come over from Seattle and and visit you for a couple days? And I was going, well, I know that I've got a slow week, but I also know that I'm preaching on Sunday. I got some other things. We got, you know, some events coming up in April. Uh, Okay, sure, yeah. Why don't you come on over? Uh, You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you head back Wednesday afternoon. Uh, We'll we'll make it work. Uh, Now, Bob... Um, he was like the, he's like one of the first people that I met when I came to Washington in 2009. Nine years. Wow. Wow. Uh, he and I are, are, are really good friends. Um, like, we, we're such good friends that when I do get married, he will be the guy that stands up next to me, probably. Like, he and I just, uh, we, we, we clicked from day one. Um, we, we have so much in common. We have fun together. And so when we get together, um, his, his girlfriend doesn't like it because she knows um, what our patterns are, um, that we go to 7-Eleven, and we watch Netflix, and we play video games, and we get nothing done. <laughs> And, and, and pretty much that's what we planned to do for, for, for three days. Uh, and so uh, in the midst of that, though, we're, we're having fun and we're laughing and we're watching you know, Netflix and he's showing me new shows on there and we're making 7-Eleven trips. The fact that it's so close to the church is wonderful, um, but not good for me. We're, we're having all this fun and whatnot, and yet I still have work because I didn't actually take the week off. And so, you know, I went in and I worked on Monday. I got some work done before he came. Uh, then I had uh, two different meetings on Tuesday, and so I just said, hey... Uh, you're just going to have to chill while I, I'm at my meetings and I do some of the work that I need to get done. Wednesday I had a meeting, and so we're, we're balancing you know, this out between the work that I still have to do uh, versus the time that I s- needed to spend with him. And I'm curious, you know, if, if I had chosen to say, okay, Bob, come on over, but then I got to spend no time with him because I chose to do the work, I, I think he he may have felt a little bit cheated by that. Like, hey, I, I came over, I drove three and a half hours, I, I took out you know, time from my week and I came over and you're just gonna work the whole time while I'm here? Like, he wouldn't have felt very good about that. 
But I felt the tension, though, in that because I wanted to spend the time with him, but I also knew, hey, I've got work to do. There are things that require my attention, tasks that I have to perform. There are people who are counting on me for different things. And so I was, I was struggling with that tension, with that how do I balance this out in the right way? And sure enough, uh, I ended up uh, working both of my days off to kind of help make up for some of that. Have you ever felt that tension? Yeah, I think um, for a lot of us, in this tension, the only way that we can navigate it is by cheating a little bit. Now, I don't mean cheating in the traditional sense of the word cheating. I'm going to redefine it for you a little bit. Uh, Pastor Andy Stanley in Atlanta, Georgia, he defines cheating like this. Choosing to give up one thing in hope of gaining something else of greater value. Okay? I've got different things that I need to do. I'm going to give that up so that I can go do this other thing and maybe gain something more out of it. Let me give you maybe some examples. Um, so I've got a friend, and she works at Starbucks, and she opens at Starbucks, which means that she's usually up at 3.45 in the morning, which means any activity that happens after 7 o'clock at night, she's usually leaving early from because she knows that she has to get home and get some sleep because she's got a job to do in the morning. So we, we have an event, we have a party, we you know, hang out and watch a movie and whatnot. She might be the one who, ha- you know, I gotta leave early, I'm sorry. I can't be there. I can't stay the whole time. Might be that uh, you, as a, if you're a student, if you're younger, that you might have to miss practice for something, right? No, I'm dedicated, I'm in this sport, I'm gonna do this. I, I, I've told my coach I'm gonna be there, but now I've got this, this family event, I've got this other obligation. Uh, I might have youth group that I wanna go to, I have these other things, and so oh, I need to either leave early from practice, maybe miss practice. Might be that uh, you, as the parent, you might have to choose one time to miss a performance of your kid who's got a, a choir concert. Uh, who has a volleyball match. And you go, ah, but I have this meeting. I have this thing. I have this project that's due in the morning that I have to get done. And we feel a tension between what do I go to? Can I show up for a little bit and then, and then leave? It might be that you have to miss one meeting because you have another meeting. There's all kinds of things where we've got to, to figure out, okay, what I'm supposed to do. And I've got all of this that I'm supposed to do. And I'm not sure how to get it all done. And the reality is, is that we don't have enough time in our day to get everything done that we're convinced or that others have convinced us needs to get done. We, we're a little bit overcommitted in all the things that we've said yes to. And being overcommitted like that and running back and forth and doing all these different things, it can make us feel very lonely. Not alone, because there's people, like I'm taking my kids you know, from one meet to another one, to another meeting, to this thing over here. I'm not alone, but I can feel lonely because I'm always doing, always going. There's always something else. It's all these options and not enough time to do them all. Well, because I'm in uh, student ministry, I like uh, visual illustrations, so uh, allow me to, to give a, a visual illustration that might help us here. Um, I'm going to need four volunteers. You don't have to do anything but stand and maybe hold something. That's all you're going to have to do. And if you don't raise your hand, I might just pull you out of the crowd, okay? So uh, just looking for four people. Who can, who can help me out? Zach, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Richie, yes. And over here. Yes. Come on. Come on up. Okay. Um, here's what we are going to do. Um, I have for you these chalkboards. I'm going to ask you to take a chalkboard and a chalkboard marker. Okay, and then I'm going to position you uh, at certain spots uh, in the room. So just go with me, all right. Uh, what, what, we haven't met. What's your name? Gage. Gage. It's nice to meet you. Gage, can you come and stand like right, right about here? And on your uh, chalkboard here, I would love for you to take that marker and nice, nice and big so that um, my dad watching at home who's old can see it on the video. Okay? Because, you know, we do post these things. We have a Facebook page. Like, welcome to the 21st century West Side. Um, so I want you to write on there, school slash work. If you can, nice and, nice, nice and big, fill up the whole space if you can, okay? And then I just want you to hold it up so everybody can see it, okay? Okay, why don't you um, come over here 
and I want you to stand right here. And uh, on your uh, chalkboard, I would love for you to write, you know, the time that we spend at work isn't, or at school isn't everything about work and school, right? Usually there's like projects, there's tests, there's things that we have to do that we take home with us, right? And so I would love for you to write maybe just projects or like slash tests uh, and just hold that up because that's an important part of our work, right? Okay, uh, Zach, hang on, Richie. Zach, I want you to come right here. It's good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. So I want you to write, uh, maybe just write performances. Okay, it's like represents the sports, the hobbies, the activities, the things that we do. Maybe it's for fun uh, and nice, nice and big. Oh, it's, that's a beautiful pea. I love it. All right, uh, Richie, why don't you come and stand over here? And uh, for you, I would love for you to just write uh, maybe just the word family, uh, maybe family and friends, just uh, you know, represent the relationships that we have, okay? And then just hold it up for everybody. So uh, these represent uh, the various things that we need to, to do in life, the different commitments that we have said yes to, all right, from school and, and work to projects and homework to the performances, the, 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 the track meets, the different things, uh, to the family and, and relationships that we have. Now... In life, our time is a limited resource, much like this rope is limited in its length, right? We only have 24 hours in a day. There's only so much length of this rope. So for our purposes, this rope is going to represent time, the time that we get to spend in any one given day, okay? So I'm going to come over here, and with your other hand, Gage, we'd love you to just hold on to that, okay? So now we said we're going to do school and work because we kind of have to. We don't really get a choice about that. All right, and then because we, we do school and work, um, we're going to have to do our projects and study for our tests and, and different things. Um, and then another important part of our life uh, is the things that we want to do like uh, for fun, the sports, the activities, the hobbies, everything else. Uh, it's great, performances, okay. So then uh, we've got our family relationships and Good job. <laughs> See, we, we, can, we can try to allocate as best we can. We could maybe, you know, try to tighten up the rope a little bit. We could maybe move it around Let's go from here to there to there to try to make sure that we get everything done. But the reality is, is that we can come up short. And then this responsibility, this commitment, this thing that is part of our life called family, it can feel like they get cheated because they didn't get access to our time. They didn't get enough. Didn't reach them. And that can hurt. You guys did a great job, thank you. Um, if, you if you would, maybe just put your chalkboard and pen just on, the, on a chair up there. Um, now, Richie, do you feel a little bit left out? I mean, you got to hold a sign, but you didn't really get to hold the rope. A little bit, okay? So uh, maybe uh, I might have another illustration that you can help me out with. Right. Would, would that sound all right? Okay, cool. Thanks for being a good sport. Yeah. I want you to feel included. Of course. Like it was you know, worthwhile for you to come up here and help me. Yeah, getting up at 7 this morning was fun too. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I want you to just hold this rock for me. Fantastic. Okay. Now I know that you know you're a little bit of an athlete. Maybe you want to do oh, some yeah. squats with it. Maybe you want to oh, hold yeah, it out absolutely. and work some shoulders. Yep. Yep. Okay. We just we just hold that rock, All right. and um, it's for an illustration. Um, but wait. Okay. So just hold it for me. You got it. Okay. You good? No problem. No problem. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. He's so helpful. He's so helpful. So, the. Uh, these signs, these commitments that we have to make, uh, we can categorize them in one of two categories. Uh, they're either task-based or they're relationship-based. Okay? These are the things that I have to do versus the people that I need to spend time with. Task versus relationship. And I think uh, that is really because we've, we've wired our identity around those two things. Uh, and to, and to, to give you an example of that, when you meet somebody new, what's one of the first two questions that you ask? What do you do? Right? Or like, hey, do you have any kids? I can't tell you how many times I've been to uh, the barber to get my hair cut. Um, and that's the questions that they ask. So what do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, you got any kids? Nope. Because we want to know 
about what you do and about your relationships. That's how we have identified ourselves. Now, I think uh, the reason for that is uh, because of that's how God wired us in the very beginning. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. Now, God, he tasked Adam with working in the garden before sin ever entered into the world. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Okay? Sin hasn't entered the equation yet. It's not there. God has provided this garden, and he says, Adam, I want you to just work. Would you take care? Would you steward the thing that I have given you? And so now God has introduced the idea of work into our lives. Okay? And then just a few short verses later, he brings Eve into the uh, situation, into the relationship, and says, okay, you're going you're gonna to do, you're going to work, but you're also going to have relationships. because it's not good for man to be alone. And so starting in verse 21, it says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. How are you doing? It's very heavy. It's getting heavy? It's much heavier the second go <laughs> around. The second go around. Okay. Okay. Well, just, just keep waiting for me, all right? Keep waiting. So, work. Adam and Eve worked to care of the garden, be in relationship with each other. And so when he designed it like this, he created the dynamic between relationship and work to be in balance. Okay? They didn't work so that they could gain. They already had everything they did, but they worked because God asked them to and because God himself works, and then they have relationship with each other. There's balance there between what we do and who we spend time with. A lot of us, though, we don't experience that balance, that peace. I believe that's because when sin entered into the world, it brought a correlation between our effort, our work, and our, 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 our provision that says, you know what, when you work and you gain more, that's going to mean more to you than your relationship. It tempts us to want to overwork so that we can have more, so we can accumulate more wealth, we can have a better house, we can build a better family, we can have more resources, we can be better, better providers of the things that we have. And the result of that is that we end up in a tug of war between what we need to do and who we need to spend time with. And usually the people on the other end of that rope are the ones we care about the most. Still doing okay? Yeah. Looks like you're kind of shifting it around. Oh, yes. Can't hold it in one spot, huh? No, no, no not really. Okay, okay, good, good to know. Keep waiting. So, these tasks, uh, they, they really apply to every, everybody. Um, they apply to all of us, okay? The way that we engage, the way that we want to do versus our relationships, okay? Uh, you're in a family. Let's say you're, you're a parent, okay? You have all kinds of responsibilities, right? You have to provide for your family, you work, okay, there's chores, you got to keep up the house, uh, there are things that are going on, you've got to take your kids different places, you got to be chauffeur, right, can't wait for your kid to turn 16 and get a, their own driver's license. You've got all these things that require your time and your attention to just get them done, okay. If you're a child, if you're a student maybe, you also have all kinds of things. This isn't just about work. You've got school. You've got projects. You've got tests. For those of you who are older in high school, you're thinking about college and, and college entrance exams and different things. You've got your sports. You've got the different things that you want to do, and they can pull you away from things that matter. I want to key in a little bit, though, on siblings within a family. See, I'm the youngest of three brothers. My oldest brother, uh, his name was Chris, and Chris was a star athlete. He was popular in school, played five sports, uh, lettered in all of them. You know, I always wanted like the varsity jacket with the name on it and all the patches that he had because, man, he was so good. I mean, he competed at state for a lot of his events, and he was always, always gone, always going, always uh, doing the, the next thing. And, and one day in, in middle school, as I'm watching my big brother, who's never home, I made a comment to my mom, and I said, you know, Chris only ever eats and sleeps here. 
he might as well just go live somewhere else. Because I missed my big brother. Now, looking up to my big brother, uh, he uh, ended up going to college in Arkansas, and uh, I ended up following in his footsteps. Um, I guess I just loved my big brother that much. And so he was a fifth-year senior when I was a freshman. He got to show me around campus, show me around the town, uh, have me over for dinner a few nights, which is better than microwaving um, stuff that shouldn't be microwaved. <laughs> college life. And it was, it was great. Well, he met a girl from Bellingham, and he moved out to Washington and married her. And it's like, oh, great. And he's talking about Seattle and everything. And, well, I met a girl from Puyallup, and then followed her out to Washington. And so now I'm in the Seattle area, and my big brother's out here also, and he's showing me around the city, and he's having me over, and I get to babysit uh, my niece, and it's, and it's wonderful, and it's great. And I'm following in my big brother's footsteps. We're getting time with each other. Uh, and then several years ago, he moved to Tennessee for a job, and we always joked that, that was going to be my next landing spot, because obviously I'm just following in his footsteps. Um, but I'm happy to say that I've broken the trend. I'm here in Washington, and I love it. I love it. But his birthday's in December, December 27th, and so I called him up for his birthday uh, and just wanted to wish him a happy birthday. You know, he's almost 40. I got to rub that in his face and uh, wish him a happy 2018. But uh, he didn't answer, so I left him a voicemail. And a little while later, he sent me a text back. And I want to share that text with you, actually, if you can read this. He says, thanks, bro. That really means a lot. One of my biggest regrets in life has been that you and I haven't been able to spend more time together or even live near each other for most of our adult lives. I love you and miss you, and I'm quite jealous you get to live in Washington. I appreciate the work you do and hope you enjoy it. May your 2018 be your best year. I've got this theory that in life, when we look back, the regrets that we're going to have aren't so much about what we didn't do. Maybe they're more about who we didn't spend time with. This applies for everyone, like I said, um, not just for families, not just for parents who have kids. Uh, if you're single, like me, and you're, you're working, and you're pursuing marriage, you're pursuing more, you also have things that take your time, that are commitments, are things that you have to do that can cost you on your relationships. The reality is, is that when we, when we struggle with this, speaking of struggle, you doing all right? You know, it's Okay, your track coach is going to thank me. <clears throat> I might do some squats. All right. We usually have good intentions with all of this, right? Like all these things we say yes to, they're good things. And we know that, okay, I'm going to do this because it's going to take care of my family. It's going to build them up. I'm going to give them the things that they want. And, and we go off to do that thing and we go, I know that they know that I'm doing this for them. I've got good intentions to build them up, to help them. But the reality is, is that good intentions aren't good enough for those that we care about most. You see, our choices, they leave people carrying a burden, a weight that they shouldn't have to carry that causes too often a break in relationship. Richie, um, maybe come over here for a second. Uh, you're doing a good job. Thank you for the, the squats. Um, squats are not fun in jeans. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. So how would you f feel if um, we went through the whole rest of the morning and I didn't ever actually tell you what the illustration was about? Uh, I'd be confused. Okay, a little confused. Little confused. Okay. Now what if uh, I said I want you to keep holding that rock all the way until life group tonight? I would hit you with it. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Well, what if I said, you know what, I want you to take this rock um, to school with you. I may not, you know what, I'm gonna step over here. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that, okay? I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. So, in, in life, when we make our choices to go do the different things that we have to do, it's like we walk over to our loved one and we say, here, would you hold this rock? I'll be back in just a minute, I promise. And then we go take care of our thing. We go do it, whatever it is. 
And oh, I might, you know, send Richie a text and be like, oh, hey, you know, I'm running late. I know it's, I told you a minute, you know, it's been an hour, but um, you know, would you keep holding the rock for me? And because Richie's a nice guy and we have a relationship and, and he trusts me, uh, he gives me grace. and goes, okay, yeah, I can hold it for uh, another hour, I hope. Well, well, then you know what? Life happens and, and things get in the way and something else pops up that we have to go do. And so then we call because it's been five hours now. And we say, I'm so sorry. This thing took my time. I'm going to be there as soon as I can. And... Richie's probably going, what the heck? Like, what are you doing to me? Why are you asking me to hold this? But again, because he, he loves me, because we have this relationship, we have this trust, he'll, he'll continue to hold on to it. At what point do I have to be away and keep saying, hey, I'll be back, I'll be there, I'll come back and take the rock? At what point is it too much? And Richie goes, I can't hold this anymore. We don't want to get to that point with the people in our lives. Thank you, Richie. Yep. Did a good job. Give him a round of applause. You see, we do this, and the people we love the most are holding these rocks. And they're going, are you ever going to follow through? You're never going to come back. I feel cheated because you're not giving me the time that I need, but I love you, so I'm going to give you grace. But then eventually it reaches a point of crisis, right? Where the, the rock just drops because they can't hold it any longer. And then usually what happens is that's right when we show up and we go, why'd you drop the rock? And they just like look at us, right? And just like that dead to me look, because it's been building up in them while we've had no clue that they've been carrying this weight on their own because of the choices that we are making. Let's not let it get to the point of crisis before we step in and invest in the relationships that matter the most in our lives. I think that this dynamic, this, this struggle, this tension, there's some things that it says about the way we view God with our work, with our relationships, with, with our lives. And there's two things I want to point out maybe as we think about um, where God fits in all of this. Okay? The first is that we are assuming that God could not just as easily fill the void at work as he could the void at home. See, a lot of times when we're on the run and we're doing things and whatnot, we say, God, take care of my family. God, would you watch over my family? God, I know that my family is in your hands. And we, and we trust him with our family, but maybe we're not willing to actually trust him with our work. And the second, we are asking God to fill a gap that only we can fill while we scurry off to do a job that a thousand other people could do. You, there is nobody else like you. Nobody who sees the world the way you do. Nobody who has the experiences that you have. Nobody who has the skills and gifts that you have. And you have been called into relationship. Whether as a parent, as a sibling, as a son or daughter, as a friend. And only you can fill that role. While there's a thousand other people who could do your job. We have to stop abandoning the role that God gave us in people's lives. We have to keep turning our eyes to God to see what he has to say about this. Because he does have a design for us, a way that he wants us to live. I want to share from you, for you out of uh, Psalm 127. Um, it says this, and starting in verse uh, 1, we're going to read the first two verses. Unless the Lord builds a house... The work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Here's here's what I take out of this, that what we do, it must originate with God. So I think too often we, we bring our agenda to God and say, hey, here's all I have to do, would you bless it? And I think maybe what this is trying to tell us is that we need to go to God first and say, with what work do you want to bless me? I want you not to just manage, not to just uh, sit in the passenger seat and help guide my life, but God, I want you to build my life from the ground up. I want you to build up my house. 
bless me with relationships, with rhythms that make sense of this tension that I feel between what I have to do and the time that I need to spend with people. I love that this scripture, that the verse 2, talks about, for God gives rest, he gives sleep to those that he loves, to his beloved Because he does desire for you to have a good rhythm, for you to have rest and relationship in the midst of all of this. I love what Jesus does in Mark chapter 6. When he sent out the disciples and said, I want you to go and share and and, and preach and, and, and do the work of the kingdom. And they come back after this, this long mission trip and they report everything that they've done. And Jesus looks at them, and because they've got no time, they don't even have time to eat because there's so many people bustling around them. He looks at them and he says... Come away with me to a quiet place and get some rest. Because he knows the value of relationship. He knows what rest and peace that brings when we have that in the proper order, in the proper place. How many of us would love to hear those words? Come away to a quiet place and just experience rest. So, what's the path forward? How do we actually step into this? How do we walk into the way that God wants to help us find this rhythm? I want to share uh, with you a a comedy sketch uh, that might shed a little bit of light on our path forward. I charge $5 for the the first five minutes, and and then absolutely nothing after that. That sounds great. Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can I can almost guarantee you that, that our session won't last the full uh, the full five minutes. Now uh, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in cash or by check. Wow. Okay. And uh, and I, I don't make change. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Confession, I'm too young to know who Bob Newhart is. 
Here's what I think, though, that we can draw out of this, is that our path forward, our solution, it's straightforward. But it doesn't mean that it's easy. There is an answer. There is a way forward. There is a rhythm. There's a principle that I believe is going to help us navigate this, that God wants for us so that we can stop cheating ourselves and cheating those that we care about the most. We're going to take the next four weeks to really unpack that principle, this solution. What does it look like? So that all of us here, we all can experience the fullness of life that God wants for us. The fullness of relationship. The fullness of doing good work. Because that's what he desires for us. So I'm going to invite you back. Would you come with the next four weeks and live into this tension with us and, and, and walk forward with some of the principles and ideas that we can draw out of Scripture that God has for us to find life. Let's pray. God, we're sorry uh, for the ways that we've cheated the people around us, promising them our time and then not coming through. Pray that you would help us make sense of this tension, help us make sense of all these, these things that we're committed to, would you step into our brokenness and the way that we're, we're living and give us life so that we don't have to be lonely, so that we don't have to live in struggle, going from one place to the next, always in fear of breaking relationship, God. Enter into us by the power of your spirit to bring us newness of life, to experience life that is really life. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.